Due to the extended time zone of our audience, I have to say today to you, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening at the same time, wherever you are located all over the world, from Western California to Eastern Korea. I am Christophe Venery, the 2019 president of the IAEE, and I have the honor to share this session. The title of this concluding session, keynote session is Shaping a Clean Energy Future After COVID. And we will have the chance to, today to have a climate address, to have the energy industry message, to have the energy uh, policy ambitions, and to have uh, also the econ economic point of views. Our distinguished speaker today will be Dr. Yu Sung Lee, President of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Mr. Jean-Bernard Lévy, Chairman and CEO of EDF, Electricité de France. Mrs. Anne Outman, former ambassador to the European Union, member of the Belgian Royal Academy. And Professor Paul Josco from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The, this session is the last keynote session of our 2021 IAEE conference. In addition, this event is the first one since the beginning of the pandemic where energy economists meet at global level. Some questions are emerging from these facts. Actually, one should wonder whether the conference has reached its target. And this target was to answer the following trilemma. Can we imagine a future for energy? And how can, could it be? How the COVID has changed the use of energy in, in the environmental appraisal? And what has changed since the beginning of the crisis in uh, February 2020, say? And what could change in the future related to climate change? In other words, is there a before and an after COVID for energy economists, for utilities, for policymakers? I will now give the floor to our distinguished speaker, but before that, I would like to remind you that you, the audience, can click on the bottom on the right of the screen to ask questions to the speakers. It is a great honor for me to welcome Yu Song Lee, chairman of the IPCC since 2015. Yu Song, you have been identified as in, in, in 2019. Uh, can we stop the video? Okay. Uh, you have been identified in, in 2019 by the, by the Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people of the world. Uh, as such, you have played a key role in supplying decision makers with, and the public with the world's most authoritative scientific understanding of climate change. I personally admire your fight to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees. It is also a great honor for me to observe that you were president of the IAEE 20 years before me. And so I would like now, right now Oysung, to give you the floor and to explain you us what you think about this, your, your, the next, for, next theme for, for, for climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christophe, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to participate in the 2021 IAEE International Conference of which the main theme is energy, COVID, and climate change. I reviewed all the past IAEE annual international conferences. It's about a total of 43, and was surprised to find that this is the first time that the IAEE annual international conference has climate change featured as the main conference theme. So I felt privileged to be part of this year's conference as chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC is a UN body mandated to assess science related to climate change, its impacts, responses to it. It was established in 1988. We provide a science base for global climate policy. The IPCC first assessment report released in 1990 provided a scientific basis for creating the climate treaty that is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. The second assessment report of 1995 was a scientific basis for establishing the Kyoto Protocol. The fifth assessment report of 2014 provided a science foundation for the Paris Agreement. 
And the recent the special report on the global warming of 1.5 degrees provided the scientific information for carbon neutrality by 2050 to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees relative to the pre-industrial levels. The IPCC is policy neutral because it is an intergovernmental body drawing its 195 member governments from the UN and other international bodies. We are now in the IPCC's sixth assessment cycle. Its short name is AR6. The AR6 is unique because it is conducted in the context of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. In effect, the AR6 began with the Paris Agreement in 2015. The essence of Paris Agreement is universal participation in climate action, and this differentiates the AR6 from all previous assessments whose main purpose was concentrated on identifying the causes of climate changes and detecting the evidence of human-induced warming. The first key message of 2014 IPCC assessment report was, quote, human influence on the climate system is clear, unquote. This put an end to the 30 years of, 30 years of questions about the relation between humans and climate change. This made the Paris Agreement possible. With this, policymakers' focus shifted to what nations should do about climate change, and so did the focus of the IPCC, as shown by the invitations it received from the UNFCCC through the decision adopting the Paris Agreement to conduct a special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees and related GHG emission pathways. The IPCC accepted this invitation and produced the special report in 2018. In the session today, I'd like to share with you the state of the world in the context of a global effort for climate stabilization. A few days ago, I happened to watch from one of the global news channels a commentator proclaiming that we live in an age of promise. Many countries have recently declared net zero 2050 goals, but in his view, with little indication of how they would be achieved, thus a series of empty promises. He's not alone in holding such a view. While there is merit to such criticism, which I think is a healthy one, there is a bigger picture whether or not you agree to this definition of our time is an age of promise regarding the goal of climate stabilization. I believe that national promises are important and meaningful, especially for achieving global climate stabilization, even more so if a promise is to achieve the goal of net zero carbon emission by 2050. Every country has to reduce carbon emissions to help the world to achieve global carbon neutrality by 2050, which is implied by the Paris Agreement goal of keeping global warming within 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Emissions of carbon dioxide increase global temperatures regardless of where they are emitted, who emitted them, and how small the quantity emitted. Almost Every activity results in CO2 emissions. Our entire infrastructure is a platform for CO2 emissions. For instance, my attendance in this virtual conference requires electricity, which in Korea relies on fossil fuel for 60% of its generation. It will decline, but will it do so fast enough to meet the goal of net zero by 2050? Will the entire infrastructure transform fast enough for net zero by 2050. Every day I move and work, adding to the cumulative emissions in the atmosphere. These will cause the temperature to rise, worsening climate, worsening extreme weather patterns, water shortages, food security, human health, involuntary migration, loss of ecosystem services, 
biodiversity loss, species extinction, and the risk of potentially crossing the threshold of irreversible changes in the natural system. Accelerating climate change, unprecedented in the hundreds of thousands of years, is already eroding the very foundation of our lives and livelihoods. To be more precise, my life and my livelihood, and your life and your livelihood, and of course, those of our next generations. These were thoroughly documented by the 2018 IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees. Our two, successful, our two sub subsequent special reports on climate change and land and on oceans, glaciers, ice sheets found that many species, ecosystems, and coupled human and natural systems are now near or beyond their adaptation limits, especially for a range of flora and fauna in terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems. I'm only one of 7.9 billion people in this world, but am causing these terrible damages to ourselves, and the rest of rural populations are also damaging themselves and me through their emissions of CO2. I'm both the victim of climate change and its cause. Climate change is a self-inflicted injury compounded by cumulative injuries inflicted by each other on the planet. Our business as usual and habitual way of living is undermining the very foundation of our life support system and attacking our health, lives, and livelihoods. It is appalling to see that we allow this self-infliction and mutual destruction to continue for this long. There is a failure in seeing the connection between global climate change and personal suffering. We often see banners exhorting, save the planet. I support that goal, but believe it looks remote, leisurely, and laid back. Shouldn't the banner read, help me, help us? Mutual destruction would stop if all emitters in the world stopped emitting CO2. This would require global agreements for action, regulations, and institutions. You can imagine the challenges of implementing such joint actions on a global scale if you consider the challenges policymakers already face for any action within their national boundaries. A carbon tax politically a non-starter in many countries. Where implemented, its levels were in general found to be not sufficient to induce a shift in consumption and investment on the scale required. The energy transition will strand fossil assets with consequences for workers and local economies embedded with those assets. Failure to achieve just transition would stop the energy transition. In infrastructure planning and investment, there's always a question of finding balance when deciding between technology, financing, jobs, carbon footprint, and distributional issues. How tough this work would be if it goes beyond national boundaries to cover the entire global community is quite obvious. And therefore, the promise of Net Zero 2050 is significant. It is the first step toward the global joint action. There is, a, there is an old saying in Korea that well begun is half done. Having made a good start, what would then be the remaining half that we must accomplish? Achieving net zero is largely about energy transformation. Energy accounts for over two-thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions. This means energy must be at the heart of any solution. Last year, CO2 emissions dropped 7%. We had the worst economic devastation since the Great Depression. And for the, re and for the first time in April last year, the oil futures prices fell below zero. And 3.4 million lives 
have been lost due to the pandemic. Certainly, this is not a picture of emission reductions in line with carbon neutrality. The climate solution, that is carbon neutrality, means emissions reduction combined with economic progress and well-being throughout. In other words, we need to decouple greenhouse gas emissions from economic development. This requires an acceleration in transition to clean, sustainable energy that is already underway in many countries and industries. And it further calls for a step change in technology innovation in many critical areas. These include enhancing energy efficiency, making low carbon electricity the main source for heating buildings and powering vehicles, capturing, storing, and utilizing carbon dioxide before it escapes into the atmosphere, realizing the potential of clean hydrogen across many industries, massively expanding the use of sustainable bioenergy, exploring sustainable agriculture, and building the foundation for a circular economy. The additional share of annual mitigation investment needed to reach net zero by 2050, including investment in efficiency improvement in energy and decarbonization is 0.36% of global GDP over the baseline share of 2% of global GDP over this decade. This means investments in low emission energy overtaking fossil fuel investments globally by 2025. Investment in fossil fuel extraction and unabated fossil electricity generation dropping by half a, half a trillion dollars per year over the coming three decades. With investment in unabated coal generation projected to halt in 10 years. This also means rapid deployment of many novel technologies for tackling sectors where emissions are especially difficult to reduce, such as aviation, shipping, trucks, heavy industries like steel, cement, chemicals, and agriculture. And investments for adaptation will have to continue regardless of energy transitions. While all these efforts are crucial and relevant to restore climate stability, I would like to point out that we are merely treating the symptoms using technological solutions to fix the problem at the end of a pipe. Often that solution creates other problems. We need instead to look at the root of the problems. How can we reduce energy and materials inputs, not just waste and pollution? and we need to consider sustainable consumption patterns. Emissions pathway compatible with 1.5 degrees, as evidenced by the IPCC special reports, show that the moderated consumption, that is low energy demand, shows us the most pronounced synergies and the lowest degree of trade-offs with respect to sustainable development and the sustainable development goals. Low demand pathways through accelerating energy efficiency in all sectors have synergies with SDG 7, which is energy, SDG 9, which is industry, innovation, and infrastructure, SDG 11, which is, which is sustainable cities and communities, SGD 12, that is responsible consumption and production, and S SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and SDG 17, that is partnership for the goals. Low demand pathways would result in significantly reduced pressure on food security, lower food prices, and fewer people at risk of hunger by reducing or completely avoiding reliance on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Consumption entails a societal burden to the extent it generates costs unaccounted for by the consumer. Just as there is a call for corporate social responsibility, 
a parallel to this would be a call for responsible consumption. Recognizing that we live in a closed system will enlighten us to search for ways to continue our development within the boundaries of the services nature provides. While addressing the symptoms of climate problems, our next challenge is to lay the foundations for development in a closed system, away from the model of a throughput economy. This may be the lasting responsibility of the humans in an age of promises. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Loi Sung Lee. I would like to introduce now the next speaker. I'm pleased to welcome the chairman and CEO of EDF, uh, Electricité de France, in this round table for many reasons. Amongst which I would like to quote the outstanding pages of economic science applied to the power sector that EDF has been writing for decades. Thank you, Jean Mr. Jean-Bernard Lévy, for delivering your address, which I may entitle Choosing the right investments in the right market design in consistency with the right industrial policy. Mr. Jean-Bernard Lévy, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, at EDF, we have always paid attention to the work of energy economists. In fact, it's been for a long time an active and supportive research area for our field. We have relied on academic research, both externally driven, but at times led by our own teams, in order to contribute to the development models that will provide competitively priced electricity to the greatest number. Of course, the rules of the games have changed so much over the past few decades, but we continue to draw on our theoretical findings. And so it is a great source of price for EDF to contribute significantly to structure nowadays again, to structure the debate between researchers and public decision makers. Where are we today? We have climate change. We have the post-COVID build back. We need to fight, as always, against fuel poverty to deliver energy to all. All these challenges in their magnitude, they make the work ahead of us all the more important. And this is why I'm very really pleased to be here with you, you the top specialist in the world, and to share with you a few analyses, as well as some expectations. Considering the energy and climate change challenges we face, three areas of economic science can meaningly inform our thinking. First, energy system and carbon modeling. Secondly, the institutional economy and market design. And thirdly, the industrial policy and development economics. I'll start by my, my first point, which is talking about the choices and technological options that can help us reach carbon neutrality by the middle of this century. It is our common objective, and it is, as you know, EDF's raison d'être for the last year or so. We, we know that some levers do work. An example is the electrification of end uses to replace fossil energy. Notably, the IPCC estimates that the share of electricity in final energy demand will need to double between now and 2050. Other levers are more controversial, nuclear power or large-scale carbon dioxide sequestration, or the extent of future electricity and gas coupling. Prospective thinking requires taking many dimensions into account. Some of them are unfortunately overlooked in scenarios that fuel public debates. The first dimension, one that is evident to any economist, is that we want to obtain the desired results at the lowest possible cost over time. So it is a matter of sustainable competitiveness and welfare. It requires taking into account the long-term acceptability and sustainability of policy choices. Here I would include the question of technological neutrality, which is sometimes mistakenly addressed in policy-making debates. The second and equally obvious dimension is natural resource scarcity. I'm not thinking not only of certain metals, but also of the soil resources needed for renewable electricity and biomass, and even, of course, for carbon dioxide storage. As we all know, when there is scarcity, there is also a value and a cost. 
On the other hand, we face the abundance of fossil fuel resources, even more abundant today than what we thought 20 years ago, and this makes the transition even more challenging. The third dimension has to do with the understanding of complex coupling, not just between energies and uses, but also between energy production, agriculture, and also lifestyles. A first example is forests and the competition between energy uses construction materials, the natural carbon sink, and biodiversity. And yet another dimension relates to time frames of different trajectories and the management of uncertainty. While it is valuable to be able to measure the risk of the bets that some advocate, to show the implication of a choice or non-choice, to build path of least regret, and to avoid the pitfalls both of insufficient R&D and of massive subsidies that end up, maybe, into stranded costs. The conclusion I have come to when I consider all these many dimensions is that we need to make use of all sources of carbon-free electricity. And of course, this includes nuclear. If we don't do so, we will create constraints that will be very costly and maybe insurmountable in certain regions of the world, including Europe. I am not expecting just one model to tell us what the optimal share of nuclear will be in 2050. At the same time, we cannot afford not to look objectively at the cost of not developing nuclear, since this is the kind of decision that will follow us for several decades. I also believe that hydrogen will play a role in decarbonizing the power system in industrial production. EDF aims to become a leader in this segment over the next five years. However, it is vital that any projects that we will undertake do have solid economic foundations, notably in terms of carbon abatement cost. Otherwise, we could find ourselves investing massively only to wind up in a dead end. So my message is ambitious and humble. Ambitious because we aim to, set, to help solve the challenges of the planet at the lowest economic, social and environmental cost. Humble in how we can achieve such a target. Humble because we must pursue and expand economic research and energy forecasting in these areas to better inform the public and as well as public or private sector decision makers. Even if we identify the best path, the best investment, the best ways to meet demand, it still will not be enough. Economic actors can only be incentivized to follow this path more or less closely by market design and public policy instruments. And this is the second point I would like to address. The energy transition will require massive investment. The assets to build, the solutions to deploy are very capital intensive and they have a long lifespan. Therefore, it is crucial to offer investors visibility on risk sharing and on asset returns. This visibility will determine not only whether useful investments are made, but also the cost of the capital employed, which will in turn determine to a large extent the social cost of energy. Just an illustrative figure here. Financing a nuclear power plant or an offshore wind field at, say, 8%, a typical expectation of financial markets in a risky context, rather than 4%, which would be closer to a social approach, makes a more than 50% difference in terms of leverage cost of electricity. With the design of the European electricity market today, we are far from that goal. The focus placed on the shorter market and on the prices on that market, is not conducive to desirable investment. In its World Energy Outlook in 2018 edition, the International Energy Agency shows that this market will only generate half the revenue needed to cover investment in low carbon energy, or maybe it would be not 50, but 60% with a firmer carbon price on the EU ETS, which seems indeed to be emerging today, which is good news. But the challenge is to find a market design that balances the short and the long term. The good solution will clearly involve tenders and long-term contracts between market actors or with public authorities and the clear rules that guarantee financial equilibrium and efficient competition to draw investment. 
several prominent economists, and I'm pleased to turn to Paul Josko, we had met uh, not so long ago in, in the United States. I could also name uh, Richard Schmalensee, David Newbery, Jean Tirole, of course, and many others. They produce an accurate analysis of the shortcomings of today's market design and the forms of long-term contracts that would be efficient. This is a second critical field of economic research, especially given how it can influence policy decisions. Public policy instruments in intended to encourage low carbon choices are needed. The theory is that a single global carbon price is the best way to decarbonize at the lowest cost. But maybe the world is a bit more complex than that. Cooperation between countries, even within the 27 country European Union, is not easy. Energy prices are they the most relevant signal or the most acceptable for many consumers? And how will decarbonization play its role in the long game? The price applied to carbon today and projected for the future may not be sufficient to trigger the developments that will become necessary going forward. In sum, the solution must be a mix of policies, a series of instruments, including a carbon price, of course, but also other tools, fiscal tools, subsidies, standards, R&D support. Economic analysis should show us how to make this edifice efficient. That is, encourage the most useful actions in terms of money spent per ton of carbon avoided. And also coherent, helping to avoid contradictory rules for instance, ones that end up favoring fossil fuels. The shadow price of carbon, in other words, the socioeconomic cost of uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, is an invaluable reference. But we'll need to make many other factors into account. If we want to go further, we will take many other factors into account. Other current and important examples of this need for efficiency and coherence is the Fit for 55 package the EU will soon decide. As it will cover the scope and the functioning of the ETS market, the taxation and the carbon border adjustment mechanism. The consequences of the pandemic and the lessons to be drawn make the third point. I want to discuss even more pressing industrial policy, which where energy is concerned, is closely tied to security of supply and strategic autonomy. To prevent a deep economic crisis post-COVID, we have become Canadian again. I have noted with great interest that energy transition investments are a major pillar of the effort to stimulate the economy with budgetary tools. The old game. And this is justified. These investments have a powerful multiplier effect, as a recent IMF study noted. One dollar invested in renewable energy creates up to 1.5 dollars of GDP. This multiplier increases to four times with regards to nuclear investment. However, I would like to mention two keys to success that I believe we must keep in mind when making choices and allocating public resources, especially in the EU. First, we can only ensure productivity gains over time by creating growth potential. This requires keeping costs to a minimum, as I mentioned, and anchoring added value in local industries. So for economists, it's almost like a puzzle to, to solve. We all want to reduce the cost of new technologies like offshore wind, electric batteries, hydrogen electrolyzers, just to name a few. But we do not want a replay of recent history when solar power subsidies in Europe creating a booming industry in Asia. So strategic autonomy must be a priority. We talked a lot about resilience during the pandemic and low carbon transition, regardless of what will be the exact trajectory followed, can deliver Europe from its dependence on imported fossil fuels. But we cannot afford to create a new kind of dependence on essential manufactured goods or on the supply of large quantities of hydrogen that would be green, yeah, but produced far from Europe. I'm aware that uh, I'm placing great expectations on economists, easier when you are not one yourself. These expectations are greater than before the health crisis and all the changes it brought. Making informed technological choices, taking into account all time horizons and uncertainties, Searching for the lowest cost solution, both as a socially desirable objective and as a means of ensuring coherence. Improving market design 
enhancing the quality of public policy and its instruments, highlighting the issues of industrial independence, energy independence. Economics will help us achieve all these goals. In addition to this great expectation, I have great confidence in you. Know that myself and the EDF group, we will be following your work very closely. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Levy, for your confidence, and uh, we, have, we have heard this message. Your message was uh, very clear, this, despite the quality of the, the image, which will improve, be improved in the future. And your message would be very, very useful for us energy economists to, man, to make some advices on energy policies. I'm pleased now to, uh, to invite Mrs. Anne Uthman to the round table. She is former ambassador to, of the European Union. She is a member of the Belgium Royal Academy and was until April 2016 principal advisor in the Directorate General for Energy at the European Commission. And your experience of the, of the EU will feed uh, energy economists with the vision of a regional approach, which could be could crises be uh, opportunities to build resilient future for the UE? For the EU, pardon me. Uh, Mrs. Anutman, the floor is yours now. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, crises are very different from each other, but they always reveal some of our fragilities. They can create new ones, but they can also trigger policy responses that offer an opportunity to build a more resilient and more sustainable future. And this is in short what I want to illustrate in the next few minutes in respect of the pandemic and the future of energy and climate in the European Union. The 2008 financial crisis saw an immediate fall in GDP and in energy consumption, both of about 6%, followed by years of austerity, slow growth, and underinvestment that particularly hit the energy sector. The even bigger fall in EU greenhouse gas emissions of 9%, as the fall was more marked in heavy industries, led to a long period of very low carbon prices in the EU emission trading system that short-term measures did not manage to redress until a market stability reserve was put in place in January 2019. But some lessons were learned. Like the financial crisis, the pandemic caused a major economic shock with a fall in the European GDP of 6.3% in 2020 compared to the previous years, and a lot more in some member states, minus 11% in Spain, minus 8.9% in Italy, the fall in economic activity and in mobility led to reduced energy consumption, mainly all in the transport sector, and increased shares of renewables and hence a welcome but very temporary fall of 10% in EU greenhouse gas emissions. But the comparison stops here. The pandemic is not a systemic shock. The rebound in economic activities is already visible and the recipe for recovery is very different. Also, after a fall in March last year, carbon prices were back to their pre-crisis level by the summer and they've been rising since. They are now over 50 euro per ton of CO2 equivalent. In fact, in part, anticipating the tightening implied by the European Green Deal. This European Green Deal was launched, luckily, I would say, less than three months before the beginning of the pandemic. And it was conceived from the start 
not only as an ambitious climate and environmental strategy, but also as a sustainable growth strategy for Europe. The idea was to consider that responding to the climate and environmental challenge requires a transformational change, which can be very beneficial also for the EU economy and for its society. And so it foresees not only measures to restore nature and to reach climate neutrality by 2050, and 50% 50 net reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030, but also measures to mobilize research and the industry to build a circular economy and to ensure a socially just transition and better health and better well being for citizens. The investment needs are huge to align our energy system to the 2030 climate targets of 55%, the EU will need to invest 350 billion more per year in the coming decade than it did in the previous decade. So when the European Green Deal was launched, it came with a substantial investment plan to support these investment needs. But then came the pandemic and the EU adopted a specific recovery instrument called Next Generation Europe at the same time as it agreed on its usual multi-annual financial framework, which is its budget for the next seven years. And as a result, the total EU budget contribution to the Green Deal reached 30% of these two financial sources, that is 550 billion over the next seven years, which is more than what was initially foreseen in the Green Deal investment plan. And in addition, climate was mainstreamed in all EU expenses. I think this is an opportunity that should not be wasted but it's not without risk and difficulty. The EU COVID response is a sort of three-level rocket with first an emergency response in the first weeks of the crisis that among others allowed member states to activate more freely their own budget. Then, new EU firewalls were put in place in April with nearly 2 trillion of debt purchasing by the European Central Bank, instruments to finance health expenditure up to 240 billion to support nearly 40 million employees in partial unemployment for 100 billion and with 200 billion in guarantees from the European Investment Bank to facilitate bank loans to small and medium sized enterprises. The third level of the rocket is a long term recovery plan, which will coexist as long as necessary with some short term measures, and it's now starting to be implemented. And I will come back on this recovery plan in a minute, but first a few words about the short-term mechanism, which has not been aligned with the EU energy and climate policy. It was designed to respond to emergency needs of EU enterprises and of workers. EU member states have already spent nearly 4% of their GDP in fiscal stimulus, and nearly 25% of GDP in guarantees and liquidity support. But many beneficiaries of these measures belong to fossil fuel intensive sectors like aviation or the automotive sector. And only in very few cases could green strings be attached to rescue operations and they could only be weak ones, as is the case, for example, with the rescue of Air France KLM. 
there is this a double risk, I think. First, that the public debts accumulated reduce margins to support future green investments. And second of a lock-in of certain enterprises into non-sustainable activities. And where financial institutions are involved, they may also be put in a position of wanting to ensure the viability of their carbon intensive clients. Things look much better for the European long-term recovery plan, though obviously not without risk either. To support the relaunch of their economy, member states will be able to request contributions in grants or in loans from a European 672.5 billion recovery and resilience facility. I cross my fingers and as some member states have still not ratified the decision that allows to finance this fund by European Commission borrowing on financial markets, including for 30% via green bonds and reimbursing using new own resources. The European spirit of solidarity means that the least wealthy and most hard hit member states will be allowed to request the largest contributions from the facility. But European solidarity never comes without conditions. Member states have to submit recovery and resilience plans focused on reforms and on investments. These plans must meet minimum expenditure benchmarks of 37% for climate action. Actually, most member states' plans propose more than that. And 20% for the digital transformations. These are the two main pillars of recovery. The other four pillars are social and territorial cohesion, competitiveness, research and innovation, health and resilience, and a last pillar names named uh, Next Generations, which is mostly about education and skills. Just as important as the priority given to climate is a two rarely mentioned clause imposing that every single euro spent must respect the principle of do no significant harm, DNSH, to be understood in the meaning of the taxonomy regulation for sustainable finance, which, by the way, is another important instrument to support the Green Deal. That is, no euro spent can cause significant harm to climate change mitigation and adaptation, that's part of the resilience aspect of recovery, to the circular economy and to pollution and to protection of nature and natural resources. So, as I said, with the Green Deal as the European roadmap for recovery, tackling climate change and environmental sustainability are mainstream. That means not only national plans must propose a large part of measures that effectively contribute to the green transition, but they also have to ensure that none of their measures do significant harm. The part of member state plans with a green tagging focuses on three big areas, green infrastructures and mobility, renewables and buildings renovation, with different specific actions depending also on the amount of money they received. For example, uh, Italy and Spain, who are the main two beneficiaries, plan uh, large investments in renewable energy and smart grids, in addition to hydrogen production. France plans large part of its investment in rail, and in particular in rail freight, but also some investment in hydrogen. While Germany focuses on electric mobility and includes also some hydrogen investments. 
the European Commission issued technical guidance to help member states apply this DNHH principle, but that will not solve all the uncertainties. Uh, one of the most controversial issues is that of investment in natural gas, which is not covered in the first set of taxonomy rules issued in April. The question is how to avoid stranded assets when gas can actually accelerate the phasing out of coal and the transition to renewables? Could such new gas investments become later an obstacle to shift to more renewables, etc.? In the end, the recovery from the pandemic could be an opportunity for positive change for other type of growth for sustainable and socially fair growth. I think it's a chance for the energy sector to accelerate its green transition. And the challenge now is in the implementation. In December 2018, the EU adopted governance rules to organize the collective effort of its member states towards the European 2030 climate and energy targets, and also towards its longer term climate objectives in line with the uh, Paris Agreement. And this climate and energy governance relies on the one hand on the combination of top-down EU rules, control and monitoring, and bottom-up national energy and climate plans and the national recovery plans must be coherent with those. And on the other hand, on a balance between carrots and sticks. The governance of the European recovery, recovery uh, follows very much the same philosophy. It's the European way. It could work, but I think it will also not be an easy an easy halt and i'm looking forward to a debate on these issues thank you very much thank you thank you very much Anne, for for your clear vision and uh, i am uh, impatient to have this debate actually uh, i will to not to lose too much, too much time i would like to to invite and i'm honored to invite professor paul josco from the mit to join the floor Paul is an American economist and professor. You served on the MIT since, 2000, since 1972. And from 1994 to 1998, you were the head of the MIT Department of Economics. You have also many other responsibilities that I cannot detail now. Today, you will share with us your vision on deep decarbonization and security of supply. Professor Paul Josco, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Of course, I wish I could be in Paris rather than in Brookline, Massachusetts, but uh, that's where we are these days. Uh, I'm going to be making remarks on deep carbonization and security supply and electricity sectors. Uh, let me start by uh, offering an overview of my, uh, my remarks. Uh, deep decarbonization, and, and here when I refer to deep decarbonization, I mean deep. Uh, that means uh, that uh, the system achieves 100% uh, net zero by 2050, as many countries uh, and some states uh, have already committed. From that perspective, deep decarbonization relying primarily on wind, solar, and storage creates operating, planning, and investment challenges due to generation intermittency near zero short run marginal cost of wind and solar generation, the need to integrate storage with various energy supply durations, changes in wholesale market price distribution, and poor linkages between wholesale and retail prices. The long run adaptations required to meet reliability, decarbonization, and economic efficiency goals simultaneously are not just tweaks to existing market planning and investment mechanisms. They require serious consideration of the necessary changes to support the transition to zero carbon electric power system. I'm gonna offer a, a US perspective and let me just make a couple of observations about the US at this time. Uh, 
and that's a picture of North America uh, uh, with all the ISOs depicted in the non-ISO areas. Uh, the U.S. has no meaningful national decarbonization policy and has been relying on federal tax subsidies and a very diverse set of state policy actions uh, primarily aimed at increasing wind and solar generation and more recently uh, at expanding investments in storage. There's no national price on carbon emissions. Uh, the Biden plan is, uh, sets an aggressive decarbonization target, but the pathways from here to there are still unclear and uh, whether it will pass the Congress or not is uh, anyone's guess. We have diverse state and, and federal regulatory structures and a diverse industry organization ownership structure uh, as well. Uh, the US is not entirely made up of liberalized markets in the West and in the Southeast. They're more traditional regulated vertically integrated utilities. I'm gonna focus though on the organized uh, independent system operator or, or regional transmission operator markets. So several points to make, and I'm gonna use uh, as a foil for this discussion, uh, some information from the California ISO on August 14th and 15th, and these are the days they had rolling blackouts. So my first point is balancing supply and demand while meeting operating reliability criteria will become more challenging as intermittent generation expands and dispatchable generation is retired to meet decarbonization commitments, or for other reasons like Politicians don't like nuclear, for example. And as I said, this is a picture from the California ISO. Uh, the blue line is the demand on the system the system operator saw. The pink line is the net demand on the system. Uh, this is the demand on the system after subtracting wind and solar generation. Uh, and, and, and the 14th of August was a, a pretty good Sunday, but a terrible wind day. Uh, uh, and since it's a solar dominated system in the summer in particular, as the sun goes down, uh, the generation from solar facilities declines and there's this end of day ramp uh, that needs to be met. And today, uh, on this day, the end of day ramp was, uh, 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 was, was fairly significant. It's, high, it's been higher on some days, but the way this ramp is met is with gas fire generation, primarily in imports from other states, uh, typically of but uh, of, of fossil generated power. And in a system where uh, we don't have any gas generation anymore, or very little gas generation, uh, this is where storage is gonna have to play a role. So investments in storage of the right types uh, that will yield the, that will supply energy for the right duration is going to be very critical. The second point I wanna make is that resource planning to meet security of supply criteria will need to change to reflect the stochastic attributes of intermittent generation and the penetration of storage. Uh, we're all familiar with traditional uh, long-term resource planning. Uh, uh, we forecast demand under various assumptions. Uh, we forecast the peak demand under those assumptions. We decide where in the distribution we wanna be. Uh, and we, in one way or another, uh, try to ensure that dispatchable generation is in place to meet the peak demand. That's going to change in the future. The peak demand is not always going to be driving the system. It may, you may still have to meet the peak demand, but given the large quantities of intermittent generation, there could very well be many other hours uh, when dispatchable generation or storage is necessary to balance supply and demand. Third point is that investments in storage with a mix of durations that match the stochastic properties of wind and solar will become increasingly important and cannot just rely on lithium ion technology. Today, if you look around the world, the storage that's being installed is by and large uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, four megawatt hours per megawatt. And that may be fine for the purpose that they're, they're being used now, which is primarily to provide a frequency regulation and ancillary services. But over the longer run, they're gonna to have to be there as well uh, to, to meet reliability conditions and for better criteria, for better or for worse, uh, the wind and the sun uh, 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 and their ability to, to generate from wind and solar facilities uh, varies significantly over time. And you can get multiple days when the wind is low, the sun is low and demand is high. Uh, maybe it's only a few hours uh, or a few days uh, every 10 years, but you need to be prepared for those. So the whole process uh, of system planning uh, is gonna have to take account of intermittency, the stochastic properties of weather and how they interact with one another. 
Uh, active demand response and demand flexibility that better integrates retail and wholesale markets will be increasingly important to co control costs and maintain reliability. And, and this in a way was evidenced indirectly in California uh, because in California, the system operator uh, issued uh, uh, orders or requests for conservation and they were very detailed. They said, please charge your electric vehicle in the morning uh, or late in the evening. Please don't run your, your swimming pool pump uh, late in the afternoon and early in the evening. Please uh, turn down the thermostat or turn up the thermostat in your air conditioner late in the afternoon or cool down your house early in the morning. But the system operator is saying, here's how you can adjust your demand. Uh, a voluntary conservation is fine, but I don't think we can rely on it forever. We need some system of pricing and load control uh, that can better match the, the, uh, the needs on the system. Uh, as they respond to variations in supply and demand. Uh, the next point I make is a relatively small amount of dispatchable generation can go a long way in controlling costs uh, and in maintaining reliability. And it raises questions in my mind and in the mind of some of my colleagues of whether saying we're going to go all the way to zero makes sense at the present time, uh, and or whether we can find zero carbon uh, dispatchable technologies that uh, can remain in the system uh, and deal with extremes on the wind and solar side uh, and on the demand side. Uh, and I think we should be either looking for what we have in our portfolio now or at R&D to develop new technologies like uh, uh, green hydrogen. A uh, significant expansion of transmission capacity is needed to, to manage access to the best wind and solar resources and to integrate markets to make effective use of both. And this is a picture from a study done by uh, a former MIT uh, research scientist who looked at the effects of dramatically expanding the transmission networks in the US to better connect regions and indeed to connect the three, uh, the three synchronized networks that exist uh, uh, in the US at the present time. And as you can see, the cost reductions are rather significant and they come from getting better access to the windy areas and the sunny areas of the country and also expanding markets uh, so that they can they can operate in a on a wider geographic scale to make better use of wind and so solar technology uh, and also storage. Financing the transition uh, based on short run wholesale market prices will be much more difficult as decarbonization proceeds, since wholesale price distributions will change dramatically as near zero marginal cost wind and solar penetrates the system. And this is an example what I've drawn here. Actually, Bill Hogan drew this. Thanks, Bill. Uh, this is a sort of a traditional bid-based dispatch curve for a, uh, for a thermal system uh, that we have today. Uh, and demand marches up and down the, uh, the dispatch curve. It's fairly stable in any season, typically. Uh, but that's going to change with deep decarbonization. We're going to have a lot of resources that have zero marginal costs, so that when they're marginal, the price is going to zero, be zero. We're then going to have periods when storage is charging and discharging uh, to uh, it, when it can arbitrage between low price hours and high price hours. And then there are going to be hours when prices should clear theoretically uh, on the demand side with scarcity price. And what happens when you look forward is there are a lot of zero price hours uh, and a lot of high price hours. Uh, and uh, the net revenues that can be achieved therefore are highly concentrated in a small number of hours. And in my view, uh, this will undermine the ability to, su to support investments based primarily on short-term price signals and that we'll have to rely on uh, longer-term price signals. And this leads to my final conclusion. Governments will become much more involved in planning and supporting financing for wind, solar, and storage in the future. They're going to use subsidies, they'll use mandated procurements, which are becoming very popular uh, in the eastern US, uh, and other schemes to match their commitments with the forthcoming supply. And if the market doesn't bring forth the forthcoming supply, uh, governments will uh, adopt mechanisms uh, to ensure that these projects are planned uh, and built. And making sure those mechanisms work reasonably well uh, is going to be a major challenge as the government gets back into this uh, into this business going forward. Uh, that's the end of my remarks, and uh, I look forward to uh, comments and questions. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Paul. And now it's time to the question uh, uh, during this session. As I said in my opening remark, 
um, this uh, conference is the first uh, we, uh, we hold at global level with uh, the uh, energy economist community. And I think and the, the idea was to know if the vision of the future was different after COVID uh, than before. And I uh, thank the speakers to have answered this question. Uh, to, to summarize, I, I would like to say that uh, Dr. Oisung Lee has all reminded all the effort made by the IPCC to set the pace of uh, the global decarbonization. Mr. Levy has explained why we should use the right investment at the, in the right market design in the, in, in the right uh, industrial policy, and I will comment that in a moment. Uh, Mrs. Utman uh, has explained uh, what, how the recovery plan could be well used to green the en energy infrastructure. And thank you, thanks to Paul for, for the, your vision on decarbonization. I will start by you, Mr. Levy, uh, just because uh, uh, you have, a, a, you have um, stressed the, the importance of long-term contracts uh, in, um, in, in the energy uh, uh, investments. And, and so uh, long-term contracting seems to be more and more advocated when debating about market design. Don't you think that it may result in less, uh, in less competition? Yep. Uh, yes, it may. But the question is, do we want competition because we are uh, you know, driven by competition or do we want uh, affordable and reliable, reliable electricity? And nobody has ever demonstrated that competition rules just by themselves will deliver reliable and affordable and low carbon electricity to consumers. So if we are only driven by competition, as uh, we know, this is the, the, the you know, passion at uh, some uh, uh, European community level, Maybe, maybe we'll end up with uh, problems of uh, reliable and affordable electricity, as unfortunately uh, some of our friends have experienced in other parts of the world. Uh, so yes, indeed, we do believe that, especially as you know, uh, I see the volatility of prices, not only spot prices, obviously very volatile, but even forward-looking market prices over a period of 12 months, 24 hours, 30 days, 12 months, the volatility of forward prices is amazing. And when I have to make an investment decision for 20 years, which forward price should I look at? The one of May, oh, sorry, June, <laughs> the one of June 2021, which for instance in Europe is today 64, 65, 68 euros, or the one that we had a year ago, which was in the low 40s, that is uh, one third less. And so, yes, we do need long-term contracts. We need planning. We need, once this has been determined, that the best offer wins, the best price for consumers. But the first thing that is requested, that is required, that was demanded, is that we provide electricity to consumers. And we uh, have some presence in the United States. We saw what happened in Texas, which by the way, I, th I think had nothing to do with the health situation but had only to do with an unexpected uh, meteorolog meteorological event. We don't want this to happen. I understand there were some casualties in Texas that some people, I understand even a young boy passed away. I'm, I'm sorry to say this. I wouldn't like to be in, in the middle of all this in, at EDF. So yes, indeed, we do believe that there is a need for competition once we have established that we will be able to deliver the right electricity to our consumers. And then the better offer wins. Okay. Um, can I make a comment on, on that? Uh, okay. We've now in the Northeastern US and in, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and New York and New Jersey run, I don't know, almost 10 uh, RFPs for wind, hydro from Canada, offshore wind, solar. Uh, and they're very competitive, these procurements. They're, one of them, 46 bidders showed up. And so I don't think competition at that stage is really an issue. You have lots of interest in, uh, in, offering, uh, in, in offering projects and the financing for them. I think a bigger challenge is, is the structuring the contracts so that they can then be integrated into the wholesale market in, a, in an effective way. 
And some of these contracts were, have been, the structures have been borrowed from 20 years ago from the UK, and they're really not, uh, not well adapted to, to basically getting dumped into the wholesale market. And then uh, the ideal contracts for storage and how you run an RFP, I think uh, that's just developing, but I'm quite confident that the, the, there'll be many competitive bidders offering, uh, offering projects. Okay, I will come back to you, Paul, but I, I have an, another question to Mr. Levy, which is coming from the floor. Uh, what is the main challenge for EDF to become a major uh, uh, utility in, the, in Europe, in the world, to perform the energy transition? The lack of uh, regulation guidelines, the lack of funding, the, what, what, is, what, is, uh, what could help you to, to become a, a world leader uh, in, in energy transition? First, let, first, I believe we are uh, at least a real a European leader and one of the world leaders in the energy transition because due to the nuclear uh, element of, uh, of our fleet, uh, we already have a very low carbon footprint. Uh, our carbon footprint is roughly 5% of the average uh, European utility carbon footprint. Um, so. I guess we have already done uh, a long time ago what most of our competitors have to do now. The question is, can we sustain this? And with the current regulation, we can't. And why, why can't we? Because the regulation has been implemented, which, is, which has been implemented by, through the European uh, Union uh, filters. And this, uh, this uh, filtering has made competition the sole uh, element of decision. So. In, instead of keeping uh, our ability to, to, to be an efficient low carbon utility, we have to subsidize our, our uh, competitors and whatever they do with that money, which you know, does often not go to investment, but goes to shareholders or whatever. Um, what, uh, what, what is happening is that the regulation the lack of a good regulation, the lack of a good long-term planning for, for our, our nuclear fleet, which we want to keep, and we, which we want to at least partly substitute with new reactors, as in other countries in, in Europe, uh, like in the UK or in the Czech Republic or in other Eastern European countries and so on. We just can't do that because the regulation has been implemented only for us because we are the former monopoly to subsidize our, our competitors. So yes, a lack of a, of a forward-looking regulation, only short-term driven by competition rules and nothing else, and uh, hence a lack of funding. And this is the major threat to, the, to EDF. But right now, I'd better be in my seat with a very low carbon footprint than in many other utilities CEO seat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Uh, I come back to Paul, and um, uh, because in, in your conclusion, Paul, you stated that governments will become more and more involved in planning of and supporting finance for wind and solar. In general, the pandemic has shown that governments are making more intervention in the, in the economic sector. Should the, this last for a long time in the energy sector after the COVID crisis? Should uh, governments support more all non-CO2 emitting technology, including nuclear, for instance? Well, uh, and not only in the US. The, 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 role, the role of government uh, is that it started by establishing decarbonization uh, commitments. And once you establish the commitments, you, you then say, well, how are we gonna get from here to there? Uh, and usually there was no plan, so they started doing plans, and they now they call them pathways because planning is a bad word. Uh, and still, not much was happening uh, with the diverse set of subsidies. So they've taken more of an interest in uh, basically requiring uh, uh, primarily legacy distribution utilities or vertically integrated utilities to acquire various resources with typically with competitive procurements and typically with you know, 10 to 10 to 20 year contracts. And the, the states are now moving on, I think, to beefing up their, their planning efforts to, to build a, uh, a portfolio around this system. Uh, there's still free entry. Yeah, entrants can, 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 can come into the system, uh, but uh, uh, 
to me, it's inevitable that the government will be will be involved. Plus, the the redesign of integrating effectively wind, solar, storage, uh, green hydrogen, and so on. It, it's pretty complicated, and 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 whether we're going to get the right price signals, uh, I think, is uncertain until we reach some kind of an equilibrium. With regard to nuclear, uh, and I like to separate between the existing nuclear and the uh, potential new nuclear. For the, existing nu for the existing nuclear, those plants that run well, that have high capacity factors, that in the US have high info ratings, uh, they ought to continue operating. It's, uh, New York just did a competitive procurement for offshore wind. It was $83 a megawatt hour before adjusting for intermittency. Uh, while I'm sure that if they wanted to, they could keep, they could have kept Indian Point One and Two operating for, let's say, thirty-five or forty dollars a megawatt hour uh, over the next ten years. So there's been a, I, I think, in a way, discrimination against nuclear in the U.S. It's not included in, in renewable energy portfolio standards. It's, it, it hasn't been a focus, although uh, uh, there have been efforts in some states to keep the plants from. Uh, from going from going out of business, but it's very controversial, and uh, I think it's unfortunate. We have almost 20% of the U.S. electricity generation is uh, provided by nuclear capacity, but the economics of going forward for merchant plants is unfortunately very poor, and they're they're not being uh, uh, assisted with essentially the same kinds of assistance that uh, wind, solar, storage, and other technologies are getting. Yes, thank, thank you, Paul. I will come back to you in a minute, but I would like to ask a question to uh, Dr. Oisung Lee before uh, regarding his, his, uh, his presentation. You have uh, stressed, uh, Oisung, the, the large spread that we have between in, uh, global messages to the people, to the world, and individual questions, which you, you took the example of a banner, the banner showing save the planet, and uh, you said that the, the question could be not the planet, but save me, save us, save us. How can we can, the, can we for, uh, can we send deliver the message to the people uh, to to be more active rather than having a global statement addressed to uh, global entities? What what is the vision of the IPCC on that? Your your microphone is off. All right, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Right. Okay. No, I think the science uh, needs to make some advance, and at, at, as well as the uh, the policy uh, front, there has to be a great deal of uh, you know, uh, progress. And uh, uh, it's cl climate change problem is uh, clearly is a you know self-inflicted injury, and it's a mutual destruction. And uh, it's, uh, it's, there's a clear lack of uh, linking, understanding of linking between this global climate change problems and uh, with the uh, personal suffering and personal uh, cost. And uh, in, in that aspect, uh, I think that uh, science uh, has a lot to deliver uh, in providing this link. And then I, I believe the, uh, uh, the policy makers uh, will have much more uh, room to uh, you know, uh, implement uh, uh, their tools. Uh, policymakers can make a great deal of uh, the contribution uh, in this uh, global uh, effort, uh, especially in the uh, infrastructure investment uh, decisions uh, in uh, developing countries. And uh, the future of climate uh, really depends upon how the infrastructure uh, development, infrastructure investment uh, will be taken in the developing uh, regions. And it has to be uh, a low, uh, with a lower carbon footprint. And uh, for that to happen, the, the, those regions, developing regions, that must uh, have the uh, financial and technological transfer uh, from the developed regions. And uh, now, overall, as we found that the, uh, the consumption and production patterns uh, has to uh, be more rational. Considering this, we live in a very closed uh, you know, system. And uh, so we found that the energy intensity that has an energy intensity uh, in terms of energy per unit of GDP that declined you know, consistently over the last several decades. However, 
the material intens intensity increased. And uh, so with that, the carbon footprint of supply chains uh, is, getting, uh, is, is getting much more deteriorated. And we, we need to recognize the, this full aspect of carbon footprints throughout the supply chain. And thus uh, we need to recognize how can we uh, find a way to uh, live within the services the nature provides. And uh, uh, that is the, I think, the uh, thinking we need uh, to have uh, some foundation for a circular economy away from the current throughput economy. Thank you. Uh, Anne, I have a question for, to you uh, because you, you mentioned, you, re, you relied a lot of, in your message on the European recovery plan. And uh, I, do you think that the, the green transition is an opportunity um, uh, for, for developing the, this plan and to avoid, and how do you think that we could avoid, as you said, stranded assets? You mentioned the case of gas and moving to gas maybe uh, uh, without any long-term vision. So why, why, um, what, what is your view on, on that and uh, to improve the efficiency of the, of the recovery plan? I'm not too sure. I'm just, I mean, if you don't mind, I, I would like to first maybe react to what has been said about, about uh, by uh, Jean-Bernard Lévy about uh, competition and nuclear. And I mean, I, maybe he knows my position, but to me, the, the, the EU has always accepted that member states decide they want to procure capacity in the nuclear field. Uh, I mean, they let the UK at the time uh, have tendering for uh, new nuclear capacity at Hinkley Point. And they recognized that the market was not sufficient. So uh, there, were, there, there was some very big uh, state support for this technology and for this new capacity. So I don't think the problem is so much that the EU is sort of focused on the fact that you know it's pure market and pure competition, but you need some fairness in the market. Uh, and, and that means that all actors must be put in the same in the same position. So that was just a small comment. And and member states can choose. I mean, that's also one I think of the the, the big advantages of this national competence with respect to energy mix, which is that that the EU accepts that one member state chooses uh, the nuclear option and can procure capacity for, uh, in nuclear including with, with state aid. So, so, I mean, then the other question is whether it should be a DF that, you know, that is the winner, but that's not a question. Uh, to yeah, me. May, may, may I interrupt by saying, uh, sorry for the interruption. Yes, of course, we, we know that. But if the, the, the standard rule is that everything is merchant except renewables, how are we going to get a long-term uh, price signal? If not by going through very lengthy, and sort of extraordinary state aid rules, which have not been meant for this in the, uh, you know, at the outset. As, as Paul was saying very rightly, if the, if the general rule is we go merchant, there won't be any, any, any uh, nu uh, nuclear uh, capacity left in the US in a few decades. And uh, it would be the same in Europe if we didn't have to go one by one in each and every country on the explanation that you cannot build a reliable uh, electricity uh, system based on merchant it doesn't work. It, you, you be in my shoes just for one second. Do I use the, the, the forward price uh, market signal at 43 or 45 euros a year ago or at 65 today? How do you do this? Okay. Thank you for your comment. Um, uh, so, and yeah. come about. Uh, you want to, no, no other comment? No, okay. I mean, there's a question about, about uh, whether the EU frame can inspire outside of uh, European countries in terms of climate and energy strategy. 
um, which is a question which has to do both with soft power and certainly, I mean, the EU is deploying all its diplomatic efforts to bring international efforts and try to bring an international coalition uh, on climate and energy, including, for example, to have uh, a carbon price. And then there is a sort of more uh, direct tool which is in preparation, which is the, the carbon border, border adjustment mechanism, which is, of course, a, a, a provision that could have a, a very strong effect on other Ladies countries who export the goods to the EU and who with this mechanism uh, will certainly be encouraged to time. either lower the emission or and introduce carbon prices. But uh, once the EU uh, will decide on the, this mechanism that will put a price on the carbon footprint of its imports, at least to start with in some sectors, which for the moment are the sectors in the uh, emission trading system that are considered to be exposed to uh, international competition and that can, you know, that can be delocalized, which means basically we don't do anything uh, for climate, uh, we just export our emissions. Uh, I think this certainly uh, is, a, is a very powerful tool and my hope is that we never even need to implement it. But that's just the sole threatening. I mean, there should be a credible threat of having a certain tool. And I think this certainly is a powerful instrument to uh, maybe do more than inspire other countries. Okay, and thank you. Uh, I uh, should say that we will, uh, we will short, close the session in three minutes. So we have a very short time. There is a, a question very interesting to Paul on the storage of electricity. Which is the most, which, the question is, which is the most promising form of electricity storage to decarbonize modern power sector characterized by uncontrollable penetration of the renewable in the markets? What is so, the best? I don't, I don't think there's any best storage. I think we're going to need a mix of storage uh, uh, to, to deal with uh, uh, intermittency. So as I said in my remarks right now, it looks like uh, Plain out lithium ion batteries, uh, four megawatt hours to one megawatt seems to make sense. But uh, an analysis we're doing uh, over the long run, taking account of the variations on the supply side and the demand side, uh, a mix of, of short term uh, lithium ion and longer term storage, uh, uh, reflux, uh, reflux batteries, uh, metal air batteries, pumped hydro, if you can, if you can do it. Uh, and others are, are likely to be necessary. And I'll just conclude is uh, analytically, I think a big missing link here is on the supply security side and recognizing that you can get periods of time, sometimes multiple days at a time when you have very high demand and low wind and uh, uh, solar supplies where you're gonna need longer duration storage or you're gonna need, or, or you're gonna need or you're going to need demand side, demand side actions that uh, can smooth out demand over long periods of time. Many of the demand side actions we talk about today are intraday demand side actions. They're not going to help very much with, with 70 hours of outages, which is what they had in, uh, what they had in Texas. So I, I, I think there are lots of interesting areas for research here when you really look at the stochastic properties on both this, the supply and demand sides of a, of a fully decarbonized system. Okay. Yes, uh, we have no time anymore. So I think uh, for us economists, so storage is what is between supply and demand, and this is the key of energy economics. Uh, so I, I, I have nothing to say else because we, we, the, the conference will be cut in a, in a few seconds. I would like to thank all the panelists. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank all the organizing team, which is behind the screen and invisible today, is, uh, making this presentation possible. Uh, and I uh, set you a meeting, a meeting for the for the next um, plenary session, with um, which will be on um, oil, on oil in time of energy transition with the Saudi uh, team. And uh, the second question will be on the role of nuclear. You, uh, you will develop that 
all this is in 15 minutes. Thank you very much to all and for your presence. And uh, I, uh, I would be pleased to see you in the next international conference next year, hopefully in person in, Paris, in, in Tokyo. We'll see if it's visible. Thank you very much. And I wish you a good day.